So the previous discussion just gave you a very high level overview of the concepts of synchronization, talked about different categories. What we're going to do now is start zooming in a little bit more deeply, and we're going to talk about particular types of synchronizers that exist in Java. And you'll get a better understanding of how all those pieces are going to work. So we'll first start by talking about Java atomic operations and atomic variables. Just a quick recap, atomicity really means things are consistent and visible to other threads when they're done. So that's, there's another name that's sometimes used, linearization. I don't like that name, but that's the name it'll show up under if you look at Wikipedia. But really, this is what atomicity is about. There's several types of atomic actions you can do on variables in Java. So one type are called atomic operations. And these are often referred to as lock-free synchronization primitives. And we'll talk about this more later. I'm just going to give you a quick, quick overview here. The way this is usually done nowadays on modern systems is through something called compare and swap. And compare and swap is typically implemented as a hardware instruction. So what I'm about to show you is sort of a pseudocode-like representation of the algorithm that's used for compare and swap, although this would typically be baked into the silicon on your hardware. But if it wasn't, if you had to implement it in software, it would look sort of like this. So what compare and swap does is it takes a memory location, so like if we're in C, it's like a pointer to a memory location, and it takes an old value and it takes a new value. And then the way that compare and swap works is it will run the following code atomically. So whatever your hardware does to ensure atomicity, like it disables interrupts or, or whatever it does, it goes ahead and it reads the value at that memory location. And if the value that's currently at the memory location equals the old value that you passed in here. If those two things are equal, so in other words, we compare, are they equal? And if they are equal, we swap. So we take the new value and we store it into that memory location. And then we end the atomic region and we return the old value. That seems a little, I mean, it's very, very simple, right? But what the heck can you do with this thing? So I'll show you what we're going to do with it in a second. But first, let me show you what unlock is. So this is compare and swap. And we're going to use compare and swap to implement lock and unlock. And in fact, if you take a look at the assignment, you'll see that it's used that way in the implementation of the Palantiri Manager. So here's lock. Lock goes ahead and takes a memory location. And while we go to that memory location and we say, if, if we say, while the memory location uh, is the value of 0. That's, we want it to be unlocked. 0 means unlocked, 1 means locked. We're saying, while compare and swap returns 1, keep looping. So the way, the, read, the way to read this is, if it's the case that the value of the memory location is not 0, keep looping. So what that's saying is, what it's saying semantically is, while the memory location is locked, because locked equals 1, while it's locked, keep spinning. And the moment it's unlocked, in other words, the value is 0, if the old value is 0, then atomically set it to 1 and return the old value. So then it'll become 0, and this loop will be false. So this is what's called a compare and swap spin lock implementation of lock. And that's essentially what the hardware would be doing. And then here's unlock. Unlock comes along and sets the memory location to 0. So that's unlocking it. Now. This is really low level. And nobody in their right mind would ever write code like this in their programs unless they were just doing it to demonstrate the concept, because it's very inefficient and very brittle and mistake, it's very easy to make mistakes. But that's an atomic operation as implemented at the low levels in Java. And in fact, there's actually something called compare and swap int that's part of something known as the unsafe class. There's actually a class in Java called unsafe, and it's really intended for people who are writing virtual machines and low-level libraries to use. It's not really meant for application developers to use. And in fact, oftentimes, it's not accessible to people writing application code. It's only available for people who are writing infrastructure code. And compare and swap int is one of the things that's exposed there. At the application programming level, there's also something called volatile variables, which are a little bit like what we just saw in terms of their behavior, although their semantics are slightly different. So a volatile variable, if you mark a variable in Java as being volatile, it means any time you read or write to it, 
it bypasses the cache. Well, it doesn't really bypass the cache. It updates the cache. And then it writes the value through to main memory, which is sometimes called a write-through cache, as opposed to a write-back cache. Write-back says write to the cache and come right back, whereas write-through says write to the cache and then don't stop, go and write to memory. So when a, when a volatile variable is read or written, it goes, you know, does not, it goes directly to jail, does not pass go, right? It goes directly to main memory and it stores it there. And if you read volatile variable in Java here at the Wikipedia link, it'll tell you about that. Volatile variables in Java have a slightly different meaning than volatile variables in C and C++, as we'll see later. Another set of things that Java provides are so-called atomic variables. Examples are, are things like atomic integer or atomic long. And these are objects that have operations on them that provide lock-free, thread-safe semantics on single variables, or you can actually have groups of variables if you have an atomic integer array, for example, but it's treated as a single entity. And so what you can do here is you can do things like atomic increment, atomic decrement of one or many values, other things you can do atomically, but it works on a, a variable that can be read and written. And so those are good examples of things where you can do more than just read and write to them. You can also do operations like increment and decrement. So atomic long or atomic int, integer for that matter, combines some aspects of volatile variables in the sense that you're, you're doing these things atomically as well as implements under the hood with the atomic compare and swap operations. We'll look at some of these implementations later on in the course and I'll show you how they work. They're really cool. And once again, you don't want to have to write that code, but once someone has provided that abstraction for you, life gets a lot easier. And then there's another type of atomic operation called a long adder that came along later in Java. And that basically is used for counters that you might have in applications or servers, typically, that are heavily contended with multiple threads. So a good example would be some kind of counter in a web cache. So if you've got a, a web server with a cache that's keeping track of the number of hits on the cache, then you might use the counter, the long adder, in order to be able to update this. And it does it very efficiently, even when multiple threads are reading and writing to the cached values. We're not going to talk a lot about long adders. That they're very specialized in their behavior. We will, however, talk about volatiles and atomic operations later in the material on synchronization. So you'll get a lot more <coughs> chance to learn about that stuff. OK, so that's just a little bit of overview of atomic operations and actions. Let's now talk a bit about Java built-in monitor objects. So what we're about to talk about are built into the Java programming language. What the heck does that mean? It means that it's implemented at the Java virtual machine level, as opposed to being implemented in class libraries that exist at a higher level in Java. The monitor objects we're about to talk about, the implementation of the operations, which we'll see in a second, like synchronized and uh, wait, notify, notify all, and so on. Those are actually written in C in the virtual machine, and they're implemented inside the virtual machine or the execution environment. So these are very low-level things optimized to be very efficient. There are two primary types of synchronization mechanisms that are provided by built-in monitor objects. And those two things are mutual exclusion and something that's similar to coordination. So as you recall, mutual exclusion is really all about making sure that one thread doesn't enter its critical section at the same time a concurrent thread is already there, right? So it's one at a time. You, you can't have multiple threads inside the critical section. That's what mutual exclusion is all about. And as we'll see, monitor objects do that by having a thing called a monitor lock, and they're used to grant access into the critical section. So we'll see this particular diagram up here will, will be shown a lot as we talk in more detail about monitor objects. And it helps you to think about the different parties involved and how they interact. Then the second thing we do is coordination. And coordination will be done with a slightly different set of mechanisms, which we'll talk about over here. And they're used to ensure that the interactions occur at the right order, at the right time, under the right conditions, and so on. So coordination, mutual exclusion, those are the two key things that a monitor object provides for you. Now, once you have those basic building blocks of mutual exclusion and coordination, you can then come along and build higher level stuff if you so chose. You could use, you could use monitor objects to build barrier synchronizers. You could use monitor objects to build various other kinds of atom atomic data structures. But that's what you get out of the box. So those are the two primary things that are provided 
unless you do more. Now, as it turns out, there's lots of other stuff in the Java synchronizer class libraries that provide much better implementations of atomicity and barrier synchronizers than you would get if you were to use monitor objects. So we'll see later that even though you could do it that way, you've already got other stuff available for reuse that mitigates the need to use the monitor object for those purposes. Any Java object at the moment can be used as a monitor object. And there's, there's two caveats to that. Built-in types like int, long, double, those are not Java objects. So they don't, they don't apply with what I'm about to tell you. So that's one thing. Only Java objects, things that, that are classes or based on classes that ultimately inherit from the Java object superclass are, Java ob are, are objects that can be monitor objects. And if slash when value types are eventually added to Java, and you can read more about value types here, then they will not have this property as well because they're intentionally designed to be lighter weight than a Java object. But for the moment, everything that's not a primitive type can be used as a monitor object. And you can do a couple things with the monitor object. One thing you can do is you can mark its methods as being synchronized. So here's an example where we have a very simple blocking queue, and we have methods like put and take. And the idea there is that you can have multiple threads called put and take, and it should work properly. And properly in this case means you shouldn't corrupt the internal state of the queue if multiple threads simultaneously try to add or remove things from the queue. So marking the methods as synchronized will ensure that. And synchronized basically says, only one thread at a time is able to execute within this method for a given object. Now, if you have two different objects, they can work independently. But if you have one object and two threads called put or take, then those threads will be serialized via the synchronized keyword. There's also a way to mark things as having synchronized statements, which allow finer level locking granularity, because you don't do it at the method level. You do it at the statement level within a method. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later as well. And you'll get a chance to implement those things. All right, so that's one part of the equation, right? Synchronize, which can be at the per method basis or the per code statement basis. However, synchronized methods or statements are not complete solutions for all your synchronization needs. They just allow mutual exclusion, which is not the only thing in town. In particular, if you were to try to implement a synchronized blocking queue with just synchronized methods or statements, you would end up with all kinds of chaos and insanity. Because if you tried to put something into a full queue or take something from an empty queue, it would either busy wait, it would just sit there and check and check and check and check and check mindlessly, which would burn CPU cycles, perhaps needlessly. Or worse, if you try to re you know, remove something from an empty queue and you don't guard against the case, you might get an exception, for example. So, Synchronized only gets you so far, right? It protects stuff, but it doesn't allow coordination. So for that reason, to support coordination, Java's built-in monitor objects provide some additional mechanisms. And these are waiting and notification mechanisms. So wait, as you see here, is a method that's used to cause the thread that calls it to wait on the monitor condition, every object in Java has a monitor condition by default, and wait causes the current thread, the thread that called wait, to suspend itself on the monitor condition until some other thread invokes the notify or notify all methods. So wait causes you to put yourself to sleep, if, as it were, and then when someone else does something that gets you to the point where you can wake up and do something, then you're awakened when they call notify or notify all. So wait is used to wait, and then notify and notify all will wake up one or more threads. Notify wakes up one thread, notify all wakes up more than one thread that are waiting on this object's monitor condition. And that's a very simple, low-level mechanism to allow threads to coordinate their interactions. We'll talk a lot more about this. Right now, here's the way to think about it. If I have a bounded buffer, like a queue that has a finite size, and of course, zero being the, one of the conditions, I could use wait and notify and notify all to allow threads to put and take elements into that queue such that if the queue is empty, the thread that's the consumer queue will wait till the queue is not empty. And if the queue is full, 
a thread that's a producer queue will wait until the queue is not full in order to put its element in there. And so those are what are often called bounded buffer problem. Those are bounded buffer problems. And the mechanisms that are in Java for built-in monitor objects can be used to implement bounded buffers. Now, as we will see later, that's probably not the best way to do it in Java, but it's a way to do it in Java. And it's a way to think about the kinds of things you might do with the low-level monitor objects. And we'll talk a lot more about this in the not-too-distant future. OK, so that's the end of part two.